came. So, welcome everybody to interventional medical image processing. And um, as you may have realized, uh, last week, Thursday, I was sick. Um, and to be honest, uh, already on Tuesday, I felt pretty bad. So right after I left the lecture, um, I had to stay in bed quite for some time. But now I'm much better. So I'm back to uh, holding lectures. So I'm not sure. OK, so this is already on. Um, so let's hide this a bit. Um, Leonard gave the first day lecture, and he told me he was a bit fast. Uh, and maybe we want to go through the important points um, of the structured tensor in Bessonness. So maybe it was a bit too fast. Did, you, did everybody understood, understand the concept structured tensor Bessonness? No? Should, should, we, should we go through it uh, on a, let's say, let's not go into all the details, but at least let's go through the concepts, right? So one thing that uh, probably wasn't that hard is um, if you want to figure out where edges in an image are, you have to look at the gradient. Yeah? So this was the first thing you should have discussed. Um, edges and gradients. And if you, have, um, if you want to detect edges in an image, you see the edges as a high intensity change. So an edge in an image um, you should be able to there will be something like this, right? And if you want to build an edge detector, uh, you have to look at the changes in the image. And what you can do is you can compute uh, the gradient. And if you now have a, so this was, would be a steep change uh, downward, so you would have a negative gradient. Yeah, you, so you probably get something like this, and then you get back to zero. This would be your gradient. And you have discussed, the problem is we have discrete, so typically if you look at the definition of the derivative, you want to make um, infinitesimally small steps in order to compute the derivative. But this is a discrete image. So the smallest step that you can take is essentially one. So what you do instead is um, you can look at neighboring pixels and just compute the difference. And you looked at the different options. So there's several options how to, to implement this. So you can implement it either as, um, as a forward difference, you can implement it as a backward difference, and the central difference. Yeah. So you've seen. Uh, you can take two neighboring pixels and just subtract them, and that will give you an estimate um, of the derivative. But uh, you can also take one pixel left and one pixel right, and then um, subtract the two, and this will also give you an estimate of the derivative. Yeah? So these are different choices that you can do to compute a discrete derivative. Uh, of course, this is uh, suboptimal. And what you want to do is, if you want to compute like higher order derivatives, um, also with the first derivative, you get into trouble with noise. Uh, because the derivation operation uh, will emphasize the high frequencies, and you typically have noise in the high frequencies, so this will emphasize um, noises. One thing that you can do, uh, one trick that is often used, um, for example, in, in Kenny Edge Detector, is that they compute the derivative with respect to one direction and um, a smoothing operation in the other direction. This way you can get more stable gradients. But uh, so this, this is like a lot of implementation details um, that you can do about that, but that is typically a very good trick. Generally, all of these things you can um, implement as a, um, as a numerical uh, the numerical derivative operations you can implement as convolutions. So the nice thing is now if you want to compute a derivative like this, what you essentially need to do is you have to take uh, the left value and um, uh, the left value, uh, the right value and subtract the left value. So if you do that, uh, then you will get a negative, um, a negative response here, right? So let's say this is um, xi plus 1, and this is xi. So 
So this is a discrete world, yeah? So these are the discrete steps. So if you want to compute these values, all you need to do is uh, you take this value, so you take x i plus 1 minus x i, and you will get a derivative in this direction. So in fact, you can actually uh, formulate this entire thing as a convolution operation. So you can actually uh, formulate this as a discrete convolution, and you should know that all uh, the derivatives you can, of course, also find uh, in frequency space. And um, here, a discrete approximation of the derivative um, could be done with a convolution mask that looks like this. So you have the pixel i, so you take the negative sign and then the positive one. And then you just um, convolve with such a mask, and you would get a derivative operation. So the other point that you discussed is you can also do central uh, derivatives, and then you end up with a convolution mask that looks like this. So this would skip out the central point, and this is a three by one mask, which is very nice because then you have a symmetric convolution masks. Okay, did, did you discuss this, like convolution kernels uh, that you can use to implement a numerical derivative? I think probably all of you know that, yeah? You've seen that. And you should also, if you think about that, the background, um, you can also find uh, this. Um, this is essentially, if you think about um, if you think about this, this is essentially the discrete version uh, of a Dirac pulse. Yeah? So of, a, of the derivative of a Dirac pulse. So you can think of uh, a Dirac pulse looking like this. So the Dirac function will be zero everywhere except at the position zero. So it should, in continuous domain, it will probably look something like this. And now if you uh, start uh, computing a derivative of this, uh, what you would get is essentially something like this. So you will have a high slope here, then it, you will have a zero slope, and then you will have a negative slope here. So it's, this one uh, has a sign flip. Anyway, but you can think about different versions how to discretize this guy. So one version ha would be you discretize at this point and at this point. And this essentially brings you to this convolution mask. Huh? And you could also, uh, this, this is, don't uh, worry too much about the sign flip. Or you could even discretize at a higher rate, like this, this, and this, and then you would have the central difference. Yeah? So you can think of, so the, the nice thing is, um, what we are essentially doing is we are applying uh, the derivative operation on the direct pulse and then discretize it. So you can think of um, this way of generating those convolution masks. Okay, good. So if we do that, then we still have a problem with the noise and then you can start um, uh, building more sophisticated masks. So for example, what I just hinted at, uh, you can also combine this with, uh, this with a Gaussian smoothing in the other direction, and then you would end up uh, with something which looks like this, and zeros here, and this. So this will compute essentially uh, a derivative in x direction while smoothing in the y direction at the same time. Yeah? So you can bu uh, build such convolution kernels and combine those two operations, and if you transpose it, you get the uh, kernel for computing the y direction. Yes? So, so you get the gradient, you get the with the mask. Yeah, with two masks, actually. So this will only compute the, uh, the partial derivative into x direction. So you take your image. Let's say the image is i, x, y. And then you convolve with this guy. And this will give you, just to keep it short, um, I will, let's call this guy not i, but f. And let's keep it short. Uh, this will be fx. This would be the derivative in x direction. And you need to 
trans uh, you need to transpose this mask, and then you will be able to compute uh, f y. And if you do that, you can actually construct the gradient, and the gradient would then be um, this is our gradient of f, and this is now a vector where you have f of x, uh, f in derivative to x and y. So this is a bit of shorter notation than you have on the slides, but uh, it should convey the same information. So this will give you the gradient. Yes? Um, how did you come up with the first This one? Yeah. Th this is essentially this one plus a Gaussian uh, in this direction. This is a uh, discrete version of a Gaussian. So. If you think about a Gaussian curve, it will look like this, okay? And now you discretize it uh, at this point, at this point, and at this point, and you will come up, if you scale it appropriately, you will get this mask, okay? Good, so this is just a trick uh, to, to get a, to, to keep of, uh, to compete, um, to cope with the noise, sorry. So you cope with the noise if you do this. So because you are smoothing in a direction that is perpendicular, and this gives you much more stable gradients. And then the next thing that we wanted to do is, um, we wanted to look at edge orientations in the, no, um, in the local neighborhood, okay? So this is pretty cool, by the way. So this gives you um, an, the gradient, and with the gradient, for example, you can determine the orientation of edges. So the gradient will, of course, point into the steepest direction of change. And if you now have a line going through the image, then it will tell you the direction perpendicular. Uh, if you have an edge going through the image, then it will tell you the direction perpendicular to the edge, because this is the direction of fastest change. Now, this is quite interesting because now we have found a way of describing edges. And what is also interesting is if we look at several edges at the same time. So for example, um, if you have a, let's say you have an edge in an image. So let's say your image um, looks maybe very simple image. This is your image. And your image looks like this. Then all of your gradients will point in this direction because this is the direction of steepest change. Now you could think about, well, I take a local area like this, and in this local area I look at the average uh, gradient um, orientation. So what I could get from this is maybe, now I take all those arrows, and put them here at zero. And let's say there is a little noise, but they will dominantly point into this direction. So if I had this, um, then I would get an image like this. Let's say you have a corner. This is a corner. And you look at gradients in this window, then you will realize that those gradients will point into this direction and they will point into this direction, okay? Now, if you do the same trick and just put them into this diagram here, you will realize that you now have some arrows that point predominantly into this direction and some arrows that predominantly point into this direction. And now, we already talked about SVD and uh, eigenvalue analysis. So we can actually figure out um, the predominant direction um, of, a, of a set of points, for example. So in this case, I would expect to have one very high eigenvalue because that high eigenvalue will be essentially uh, associated with the, uh, with the normal of the edge. So I would expect something like lambda 1 as one eigenvalue to be um, much greater than 0. And I would the smaller eigenvalue, I would expect it to be approximately 0 in this case. 
And if you look at this one here, I would expect uh, lambda 1 is approximately lambda 2, and both of them are greater than 0. And of course, if you have a flat area, we would expect both eigenvalues to be close to 0. Huh? Nothing happening there. There's not very much signal, so you, maybe you have a little noise, but um, no uh, distinct eigenvalues. OK, so this is pretty cool, uh, because now we are able to interpret the regions. So we can now, dis we found a way to distinguish uh, actually an edge from a corner and a flat region in the image. So now we still have to think about how we can actually compute that. And the way to compute that actually uh, is, is the structure tensor. Okay, so this is the structure tensor. And what we do in the structure tensor is, in order to compute it, we just take the gradient and multiply it uh, with the gradient transposed. If you do that, uh, you will immediately realize you will get a matrix that looks like this. Um, so you have the two components there. And you have Do you realize something about this matrix? Do you like this matrix? Do you want to do eigenvalue analysis on this matrix? Yes, everybody likes to do eigenvalue analysis. Well, one thing you immediately realize, if you divide this guy uh, by fx squared, you end up with the vector 1 and uh, fy over fx. And if you divide this one here, with uh, fx, fy. Huh? So we end up with 1 here again. Sorry. So you end up with 1. And here, if you divide this by fx, fy, you end up with fy over fx. Realize something? Both columns are linearly dependent. Yeah, and of course, they must be because this emerges uh, just from a single vector. So this is the outer product. Yeah. This will always produce a matrix that is of rank 1. And we can easily show that by dividing this uh, vector over this element and this vector over this element. And you've shown that they are linearly dependent. OK, so this matrix has rank 1. So this is maybe not a good idea to do that. So what you do instead is you essentially um, compute the average over your local neighborhood. Huh? So we do this, but we actually take our local neighborhood here. So this was the local neighborhood. And then we compute this average, and you can do some weighting. Uh, but this will allow you to look at several vectors at the same time. You will find a slightly different formula in the script. But uh, you can also introduce a weighting here. So let's call this a wi. And then you can introduce something like a Gaussian term in here. Huh? But if you do that. Uh, you end up with a combination uh, of several rank 1 matrices, and this will give you something that has full rank. This guy, this procedure here is relaxation. So if you deal with structured tensors, you never look into a single pixel neighborhood. You always need uh, to calculate it over a neighborhood that is greater than a single pixel. You can also introduce a Gaussian weight. The, you'll find the version of the Gaussian weight in the script. But you need to, over, uh, to average over a certain area, because otherwise you will only get one significant eigenvalue. So this is called relaxation of the structure tensor. And if you want to do the eigenvalue analysis, uh, you need to relax your structure tensor. Otherwise, you end up with nonsense. OK? Um, and this is now very useful, because with this kind of ideas, you can uh, differentiate uh, corners from edges uh, from flat areas in the image. Yeah, and there's a, there's a little more to it, but um, this is the fundamental ideas that uh, we wanted to, to deliver here. You can compute this faster 
uh, the, the eigenvalues and you can do st stuff like the Harris corner detector. Um, but uh, if you know this, this is essentially the relevant information and how to use the eigenvalues to differentiate edges from corners. And this is very useful because we will use a very same uh, concept in the Wesselness filter. So ev everybody okay with this? Could, or was it too quick? Yeah? Oh. Excuse me? It was a little bit fast? So maybe you want to ask a question. Maybe I can say something to, to support this. Yes. This sigma? Oh, this is a W. Um, well, you, this one here? This one? The sum, ah, this one, this is a sum. This is a sum, and by the way, I'm missing indices here. Of course, they need an index. And this is a sum over i in the neighborhood. So this is in order to not only look at the single pixel, but to actually look at the weighted average of all the vectors in this area. That's the idea. Yes? This Gaussian up there, this one, this was only for reducing the noise. This is a low pass. Well, you're essentially averaging over a small neighborhood, and noise is mainly driven by high frequencies, and the low pass will remove the high frequencies. Yeah? You also have a question? No. Yes? Yeah. Well, you, if you only look at, at a single pixel, you will only get one direction. Yeah? So, and of course, this structure tensor will only have rank one if you only have a single direction. So you somehow need to incorporate several directions in order to be able to look at the average direction in that area. Yes? Yes. If you look at one pixel, there's only one direction. And what you typically do is you take this... Yeah. Yeah. When when your pixel is in the, in this here, for example. This one, no. This one, the, exactly the corner pixel. Yeah. This is why you're looking at the neighborhood. Oh, okay. So in order to perceive a corner, so even if I, if I take away the context, you, it will be difficult to detect the corner. Yeah. Yeah? So you need some context to detect the corner. Yeah. And now you can use this neighborhood and use a sliding window approach and look at all the possible neighborhoods, compute the eigenvalues, and now uh, you can think about if I found, if I build a corner detector, I'm only interested in pixels, which are in a neighborhood which produce structure tensors whose eigenvalues, uh, who has two high eigenvalues. Uh, this would be a corner detector. Okay, good. Then we can go ahead and look at the Wesselness filter. And the Wesselness filter is a very popular choice in medical image processing. 
One reason probably is that medical imaging also deals with a lot of vessels. And vessel-ness filter has been introduced uh, by Alex Frangi. And Frangi came up with this very nice idea to build a kind of image processing approach or image processing approach to detect vessels. And the main point that the main observation is that if you look at an image of a vessel, typically let's say your image looks like this and you have this vessel in here, there's several observations. There's actually two observations that are quite important. And I'm, I'm trying to draw this here. So one thing is vessels typically have different diameters. A vessel can have a larger or smaller diameter. So this is one problem that you have to consider in a detector. And the other problem is you want to have some kind of filtering approach that is sensitive to vessels. And if you now look at profile along here, so let's say this is a profile across the image, then it will probably look like this. Okay? So if you want to build a, a vesselness detector, you're interested uh, in this point because you have a very high curvature in this point. So you want to build a curvature detector. So Frangi, Frangi's idea is a lot, is very similar to this idea. But now Frangi isn't looking at the gradient, but instead he's constructing the Hessian matrix. So he is using the Hessian matrix, and he puts in there second-order derivatives. So he's computing derivatives in x and y direction. And with this, uh, you can see that we can again construct a two-by-two two matrix. And this now has second-order derivatives. And if you now look at areas that have or at points, actually, that have, curvi they, that have curvature in one direction, you get something like this. So if you have a structure that looks like this, then you will get a high curvature in this direction. So because here you have this profile, and along this profile, you have no curvature. You just have a flat profile here. So this is a tubular structure. So what we are aiming at is vessels, and vessels will have a high lambda 1, significantly greater than 0, and we will have a lambda 2 that should be approximately 0, or it should be small. And if you look at other structures that may appear in the image that involve curvature, one is something like this. This is, a, uh, this is called a blob. And a blob will produce the following profiles. So if you look at the profiles here, you, along this profile, you will also get this. And along this profile, you will also get this. Okay? This is a local area, a point, that has a high curvature in both directions. So in this case, we would expect lambda 1 lambda 2 to be higher than 0, and uh, we would both expect to be approximately the same. This would be a blob. So now the vesselness idea is that you want to look for areas that have mainly one high eigenvalue, and the second eigenvalue is very small. The other idea that Frangi is using has to do uh, with this problem of different vessel diameters. And what Frangi is proposing to do is actually that you construct something like an f, x, y, and you introduce some variable s, and s is the scale. So what we are doing is we take our original image, our input image, and then we convolve it with a Gaussian of the scale S. So in this way, I can choose different standard deviations for S of the Gaussian. 
and I can create different versions that are, de that are smoothed with different degrees. And in the images with a high degree of smoothing, all the small vessels will disappear. And in images which have um, a low standard deviation, you will still get a, a sharp contrast for the smaller vessels. So this is the other trick that Frangi is using. He's, use, he's constructing the scale space. And from this scaled instances, you can then compute um, your Hessian matrices at every point, which will give you such a small matrix at every point. And then the next step, you do eigenvalue analysis. And then you can reconstruct or you can construct the vesselness measure. And in order to do so, he is using two intermediate values. And he is calling RB, this is the blobness. And the blobness is nothing else than a lambda, sorry, lambda 2 over lambda 1. So if you have a high first eigenvalue and a low second eigenvalue, this will be close to zero. So we want this blobness to be close to zero. And if you have the case of a blob, they will be approximately the same. So we will get something that is close to one. And we want to prevent the blob case. The second measure that he introduces is S. And S is something he calls the structuredness. And the structuredness is nothing else but lambda 1 square plus lambda 2 square. And we want this to be high. OK? The reason for this is if you have um, high um, curvature, you probably also have a very high contrast. So there's a lot of, of change going on. And a lot of change uh, means a high contrast. So these are the two intermediate measures that he's using. And then he's combining them in a kind of probabilistic sense. And this you can write then as the vesselness measure. So at every point x, y, and every scale s, you can then get, and it has a, two, it has a slight um, differentiation, so it will be 0. Um, if lambda 1 is 0. You just set it to 0 if you don't have, uh, a, if you don't have a high eigenvalue. Or you can say, if this is approximately 0, you just put it to 0. Yeah? So this helps you to reduce false positives. And then the next step is, he is essentially using Gaussians. He's trying to construct a probabilistic measure, and he's using Gaussians. And the one Gaussian that he's using is just e to the power of minus um, rb square over 2 beta. So here, here, here we are using the blobness. And if you think about this guy here, this is a Gaussian with uh, zero mean. And this Gaussian with zero mean will simply look like this. OK, more or less like this. So if it's close to 0, and here we have 0, it will be high. And this is something what we wanted to have. So Rb should be close to 0. And if we just plug it into a Gaussian curve, we will get something uh, that is close to 0. And I think I'm missing a square here. Sorry. So beta is a kind of standard deviation. And the other thing he's doing, he wants to use this one as well with a Gaussian. And here he just picks 1 minus e to the power of s square over 2c square. Now, this is 1 minus a Gaussian. So if you think about this guy here, you will realize it will look like this. OK? So this is exactly the opposite. Because we want the structuredness to be high. So we have a high value, and then it will be close to 1. 
So let's say one is here. And if the blobness is small, it will be also close to one, and then he just multiplies the two. And this is how he constructed the Wessenfels measure. And with this, you get for every scale a kind of probabilistic mask that will tell you for every pixel the likelihood of a Wesselness being present. Okay, so this is a complete heuristic. So you think about what are the properties that we want to have in the image, and then you construct the vessel, a vessel measure that actually measures this. And to be honest, um, not to forget the last part, of course, uh, x and y is just the maximum over the different scales. Maximum over s. This is the final measure, uh, vesselness measure. So you pick the maximum over the different scales, and this will construct the vesselness. Okay. So what did we learn so far? So Frangi is, why is, this, why is this algorithm so popular? You can think about that. So one thing is, it's just very, very, very nice constructed. So if I explain this to you, you guys will say, oh, this looks, this looks interesting. Yes, that makes sense. And then you construct this Wesselness measure. But it's also kind of heuristic. So there is um, no proof of optimality for detecting vessels here. So we just looked at the image, looked at different properties, and arranged them in an interesting way, in a, in a really beautiful way, to construct such a measure. So this filter is quite popular, and you will find tons of papers using the Wesselness filter, or also called the Frangi filter. In literature, you will also find the term Frangi filter very often. And yeah, you will also note that it has a couple of weaknesses. There's, uh, there's extensions to it. For example, the filter has problems in detecting uh, the bifurcations. So you see here's a branch. At this point, two vessels branch. And exactly there, you will not get a very good response from the vesselness filter because this isn't exactly tubular. A branch is not a very good, a tube is not a very good model for a branch. But there's extensions then to actually cope with branching and to fill this up. So, very popular method, Wesselness filter. If you apply it in ultrasound, you can write a paper called Frangi Goes US. There is actually a paper called Frangi Goes US. <laughs> and it's uh, investigating vesselness in ultrasound images. Okay, so much about uh, the theory of vesselness. Yes? No, this is, uh, this is a beta. Um, no, I'm just introducing a variable called beta to get out the standard deviation. So these are design parameters. So you can choose C and beta, um, and they are design parameters. But for, uh, for, B, uh, for beta, you can essentially take 0.5, because this is valued between 0 and 1. Um, and for C, this is a contrast-dependent variable. But there's also very few parameters, so if you implement it, uh, it will actually look quite nice. Good. So I also have a couple of examples of this resonance because I can tell you, yeah, resonance is a nice thing, but actually uh, you can also apply it on some images. And this is actually the paper by Frangi, Multiscale Vessel Enhancement Filtering. And it was published on Mikai, a very popular imaging conference, medical imaging and computer-assisted intervention. So here's a couple of images from the paper. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side the image. And here you can see uh, different um, versions of the vesselness. And you can also inverse the contrast. 
So this, is, this actually works on multi-scaled uh, vesselness, uh, on multi-scaled vessels. And you can see that uh, at branches with, with bifurcation here in the top where you have more complex structures, uh, it gets some trouble. Then you can also use this not just on, on X-ray images, but also in other modalities. And it's also very popular in uh, eye imaging, in fundus imaging. It's also very popular. And here you can find uh, the output of the vesselness filter uh, and some, some ground truth uh, vessels. So this is actually fairly good. The bigger vessels you get pretty well. And here is a different example. So you can, can get uh, larger vessels pretty well with this kind of filtering. And here is some example of a high resolution fundus image. And here you can see that the vessels are uh, detected quite well. But you also detect other like curved structures here. So for example, um, this is actually the spot where, where all of the vessels meet. So this supplies essentially the retina, these vessels here. And here at this point, they all uh, leave the retina. And you can imagine that, uh, at, that at this point you have very thick vessels. And in fact, you don't uh, have a lot of cells that perceive something. And this point is also known as the blind spot. So this is the point where all the vessels leave the retina. And you can see that um, you also detect uh, a couple of structures here as well. And here where you have the very fine vessels in this area, you have the uh, you have the most re um, you have the most receptors, and here you have the best um, optical resolution on your retina, and you also have only very small vessels. Okay, you can of course also do this in angiography, and this is again from the paper with the 3D version. Don't look too much at the 3D version. I mean, if you want to implement it, it's uh, and if you need it, it's a it's a useful implementation. But if you're uh, preparing here for the lecture, the 2D version is completely sufficient. But it also works in 3D. And I think here you have outputs for the different scales. So here you have this output for the small scales, the intermediate scales, and then the big, big vessels here. And then you can construct it into a single vesselness image by using the maximum. OK, so far questions about vesselness? No, not the case. OK, good. Then we can continue with a different topic. And we will stay a bit in the area of feature extraction, feature descriptors, because uh, feature descriptors are really useful if you want to compare different if images. And we will shortly look into the different feature descriptors here. Yes? So the combination of low pass and high pass yeah. in the in which image the vesselness filter here you're talking about this one yeah this is just a different scale so here you have the original scale on the left hand side and the curvature detection and it's because if you have large structures, the curvatures are also elongated. So you, um, if you want to, if you compute your derivatives, then uh, you also need to um, apply this kind of filtering uh, to smooth out. Otherwise, you get uh, too, my, too many false positives because of image noise. Uh, yes? Excuse me? Can I use another filter for the small scale as well? Yes, of course. There, to be honest, there's hundreds of uh, different implementations of Vesselness. And so Vesselness is really popular, and there's really a lot of extensions available using different filters and other tweaks and other heuristics. So this has uh, sparked a lot of ideas how to construct uh, new filters. 
And there's also things like medialness and so on that have been expanded uh, from the idea of wrestleness. Yeah, so there's many extensions. You don't have to stick to this one. Yeah. Of course, before you go ahead and uh, implement uh, Wesenless, you can also do a short literature review and look at the different versions. And there have been plenty of papers published on Wesenless for different purposes and optimized for different modalities. So you can go ahead and uh, review that. OK, so feature descriptors. So we also, now we, we took uh, almost one hour to repeat uh, the coarsely the contents of last lecture, so we can still proceed to something new. And what we want to, what we actually wanted to learn today is something about feature descriptors. So first of all, we want to think about what is important, which are important features in an image. Then we will think about how you can actually recognize features, how you can actually find them again. So we will talk a bit about matching. Then we will talk about feature detectors. This is something that is actually looking at the image, similar to our corner detector. And then we want to, fi uh, want to find a good rule how to actually figure out a point or an area where something is going on. And once we found an area that is somehow interesting, we want to, want to be able to describe it. So we will uh, generate a descriptor. So these are the two things. And of course, we want to detect always the same points that are interesting. And of course, if we found a point that is interesting, we always want to extract the same descriptor. And then we'll talk a bit about matching correspondence search and some applications in medical image processing. So we'll probably have to continue on Thursday because we won't uh, manage to go all, uh, through all the slides today. But at least we will look at um, the requirements and the invariances. So typically, we have many different modalities. And what we want to do is we want to be able to compare them with each other. So for example, this is a uh, stereo vision guided uh, image, uh, image guided uh, radiation therapy. And here you want to irradiate the patient. So he has some kind of cancer and you want to irradiate him in order to kill the cancer cells. Here, so you actively use radiation to kill the cells. And what you can see here in the center image, this is actually the treatment device, this arc here. And this is generating photons of very high energy. So this has uh, megavolts. And with this, you penetrate the tissue and you actually, uh, actually start altering the tissue because of the very high energy that you are using. And now what you're doing is you, you can see that this uh, kind of gantry is not always at the same position. You're not irradiating always from the same direction but instead you can actually rotate around this point here. And what you want to do is you want to localize the tumor in the body and then you irradiate from different directions. And the idea is of course that all of the directions include the tumor, but you want to harm as little the surrounding uh, tissue as possible. So you want to destroy the tumor without destroying the surrounding tissues. And this is why you irradiate from different directions and deposit as much dose as possible inside the tumor to kill it, and as few dose as possible in the surrounding tissues. And one thing that you have to do is, of course, you have some prior CT scan or some MR scan where you have figured out where the tumor is and how big the tumor is. And the first thing that happens is um, your patient comes in, lies down on the table, and he's in a very different position. So you have to align him. And you can do that, for example, with surface cameras. And this is the example here. So the first thing is you take several. So here, see, this is camera one, and this is camera two. And they're mounted on the ceiling, and they have full view of the body. And of course, we don't want to use um, uh, x-rays, for example, for the positioning. But we want to use the surface information instead and align the surface of the patient with the surface of the prior CT. And once he is back in the same position, we can then start irradiating. And we don't need any additional dose during the positioning. So we can all do that from the surface. 
So there's a couple of things you want to do. And one important thing is if you use two cameras, you have camera image one and camera image two, but you want to construct the entire surface of the patient. So you want to reconstruct first the surface and there you need to be able to detect feature points because you don't want to run uh, the algorithm on the entire set of points, so you only want to run it on a subset of points because it will be way quicker. If you have a million points in the one camera and a million points in the other camera and you try to register them to each other, it will take a lot of time. But if you only take key points, important points, and register them to each other, then you will, do, will be able to do it in real time. And of course, you have to use two cameras because if you just had a single camera, imagine this is your patient, no? this is your patient surface, and you use a single camera like this, then you will, of course, get something, but you will mainly get this surface here. But of course, this information here is also relevant, right? You want to get the boundaries of the patient, right? So what you do is you take one camera here, and then you get this field of view, and you get another camera here, and you take this field of view, and you can reconstruct the sides of the patient much better. But of course, you need some overlap area here in order to be able to perform the registration between the two. And with this, you can then reconstruct the entire uh, surface. Then from the surface, you can uh, extract key points. And with the key points from the entire surface, you can match it to the prior CT. So you do a registration between the CT surface and the surface you got from the camera. And doing so, you will hopefully find the tumor position inside the body. So this is some um, kind of background. Uh, so of course, you also use stereo vision here, but we won't go into too much detail about stereo vision right now. We have an entire lecture about this later. And we will use this. This, this is a, uh, the kind of sensor that is being used on the right-hand side. And here you have a speckle projector. And you have an optical texture camera. And you can then reconstruct the position of the different speckle points because you're projecting a known pattern, pattern into the scene. Then you have some camera that is able to detect the pattern, and by the deformation of the pattern, you are able to reconstruct the depth of every pattern point. So this kind of technology is very, yes? Oh, yes, that's, that's right. So. Uh, this one here, right? Better? Okay, so with this kind of camera, and this is actually very similar to what the Kinect 1 sensor did. It's projecting a speckle pattern into the scene, and from that you are able to reconstruct the 3D points of the speckle pattern. A nice thing about this is it will give you a dense surface. So typically, if you use stereo vision approaches, you can only get depth information at points that have texture because you have to be able to match them. If you don't have texture in the scene, so if you use a traditional stereo system and try to image um, a flat white wall, you will not get any depth information because you don't find any correspondences on a flat white wall. But if you're using some projector into the scene, then it will always get a pattern and then you will be able to construct the depth image. The uh, other very interesting point about this is you can use light uh, that is invisible for the human. So you can still project a pattern, but it won't interfere with human vision because he won't be able to perceive it. And this is actually done uh, in the video game consoles or in the uh, older generation of uh, the Kinect sensor as well. Good. Um, yeah. A lot of the computer vision features that we look at, they are based on local information. And local information uh, is also quite interesting, but you have to be careful that you also extract meaningful descriptors. 
So let's talk a bit about the requirements that we have for a feature. First of all, it's a good thing that they're local because then uh, we can very quickly compute them and they will be rep representative for a certain side, uh, size of neighborhood. So you also need to be able to figure out the location but also the neighborhood. Then furthermore, it should be in invariant to transformations. So let's say you, um, you have some transform on the image and you, you still want to be able to detect the same point, which essentially points down that you want to have them uh, repeatable. So if I run, if I take the same image and I do a slight shift or a slight change to the image and I run it once and I run it a second time, then I want to identify the same points. And here you can find an example where I um, determined a similar point cloud. So if I would try to match those four points to each other, we would have to a one-to-one -one match. So I would match this point with this point and this point with this point but it would be a completely wrong correspondence. So if I want to run the feature detector again, I want to find the same points, not different points. So they should be repeatable, and I should be able to quantify this. Then they also should be uh, distinct. So if I take this point, uh, the red point in the center, and I compare it to different other key points in the other image, then it should only be similar to points that, um, that have the same local information. So they, they should be distinct. I should be able to compare different points and find differences. And of course, I want them to be robust. And I want them to be robust to illumination. So if I switch on the light or switch the light off, the matching should still work. It should be invariant to the viewpoint. If I go closer or farther away with a camera, they should still obtain the same features and the same um, locations. And of course, you want to be robust to noise. Okay, so actually there has been a lot, um, there have been a lot of different approaches going on in order to find good feature descriptors in computer vision. And this has been a research topic for many years and they have many different approaches have been suggested and you can recognize that they have gradually developed to rather good feature sets, to rather good point descriptors. Okay, so how can you do that? So once I have those points, I have key points, then I want to match them. So I want to compare them with, with each other. And if I just have two images, I can run my feature detector, and hopefully the feature detector will detect the same points in both images. Then I compute a feature descriptor. The feature descriptor should be able to, to, to describe the local area around my key point. And once I have that, I have essentially, the feature descriptor is essentially a vector of numbers. And with this vector of numbers, I can compare to another vector, for example, with the Euclidean distance. So I can just subtract them and uh, compute the L2 norm of the vector. Yeah? So this is one thing that I could do. Or uh, I could also find very different uh, approaches to compare those features. And this will then give the matching because then, I can, uh, then I'm able to define a similarity between those feature descriptions. So what can I do? Well, I can do a, a full search, of course. If I have n key points in the one image and n key points in the other image, uh, then of course I can run a, a comparison of all points with each other and find the most similar ones. But then I have to compute a distance between all of the paired points. Uh -huh. So now you can actually see the slides, but you can no longer see me. Um, but this is too much, right? What happens if I, this is even worse. Can you see, still see the slides? Okay, now we can, we can vote between a good video recording or a good performance in the lecture. Can, can you still see something? If you can't see it now, you can look at the video and then you will be able to see it. 
Okay, then you of course you have to match them and uh, you have to do that in a kind of clever way. N maybe comparing everything with everything is not the best choice. Good, then let's talk a bit about uh, feature descriptors and um, how can we identify distinct locations. So one thing that we've been already talking about is for example corners. Corners are somewhat interesting in an image, but you will realize that we'll find plenty of corners in images and we want to find um, interesting points and of course things might happen in different scales. So we may also want to have a detector that is actually uh, insensitive to different size. So let's say you go towards an object, it will become magnified and if you go away, uh, it will become smaller. So of course you want to be uh, to have something that is invariant to different sizes. So for example, from the intensity profiles we've already seen, we can do first order derivatives, we can do sec second order derivatives, we can build the structure tensor or the Hessian matrix. And um, a lot of these feature detectors actually build on this. Actually the Hessian matrix is a pretty popular choice to figure out points that are interesting. So essentially, one very successful way of finding interesting points is finding blobs in images. So a blob is, um, is a rather interesting point in an image. And you can look here, um, for example, for uh, different purposes, there has been a, a big benchmark in 2000, and there the invariance to different transforms has been looked at. And for example, you can use, uh, so this, the, 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 these are, these were state of the art feature detectors and you can uh, look at here and you will realize that the Harris corner detector, this one here, is actually doing a fairly good job uh, if you rotate the image. So corners, you can still detect corners even if you rotate the image. So corners are doing a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good choice if you have some rotation of the image. But as soon as you start scaling, they realized uh, in 2000 that none of these detectors are very good to scaling. So as soon as you have a magnification by a factor of two, all of these detectors will drop down. So none of them had a very good performance with respect to scaling. So corners are interesting, but as soon as you start scaling, then your corner detector doesn't have a very good performance. So you want to be able also to cope with different scales. So what can we do about that? Well, we can also look at uh, a couple of other things. And let's see here. Yeah, this is general repeatability, ah, illumination and noise. So for example, if you have uh, different illumination, also corners are quite interesting. And if you have varying degrees of noise here again, um, well, there's, there's better choices than corners, of course, if you have noise. So, at two in, in 2000, um, the problems with, with noise and illumination, they are, they, are quite of, they are quite okay. But you had a lot of trouble with scale. So, as soon as there were images of different scales and you were moving back and forth toward, with an object, you would not be able to recognize it again if you just used um, yeah, simple local features. And uh, one of these simple local features is the Harris corner detector. And it's again, uh, it's again built um, on the gradient approximation and it's also using the structure tensor. And here you can actually find a very similar uh, notation as I wrote down here on the board. So this is the gradient with the gradient transpose and then the weighted, uh, the weighted sum over the local neighborhood. So based on the uh, structured tensor, you can then do uh, this corner detection, and it's again using these ideas. Uh, if you have here uh, um, eigenvalue 2 over eigenvalue 1, or eigenvalue 1 over eigenvalue 2, uh, depending on the eigenvalue analysis implementation that you have, uh, then you will get uh, edges in those areas here 
So you have one distinctive uh, eigenvalue, and if you have two large eigenvalues, you have a corner, and this will be a flat area. And in case you forgot how a corner looks like, this is how a corner looks like in an image. <laughs> okay. A one way uh, to actually exploit this uh, without um, having to compute the eigenvalue all the time is uh, you can use um, this simple trick here. You compute the determinant of your structure tensor minus the trace uh, uh, to the minus the trace. So let me see. There is something wrong with the brackets, isn't it? No, this is the determinant minus mu, the trace of the matrix to the power of two. This is Harris corner detector, and this is uh, very useful because you can also write down the determinant as lambda one times lambda two, and uh, minus mu uh, lambda one plus lambda two square. So this would be the determinant minus the trace, and this is a useful measure for detecting corners. But you don't have to do, if you use the implementation here on the left-hand side, you don't have to do actually the eigenvalue analysis because you get uh, this kind of combination of the eigenvalues here on the right-hand side. So now we can do that. Given a noisy input image, you will first have to get rid of the noise, and what you typically do is you do some edge-preserving denoising. And we will also talk later in this class about edge-preserving denoising. So we'll talk about bilateral filters and um, guided filters. And you can see this helps a lot. And this helps a lot with false positives. So we first of all get rid of the noise and you try to preserve the edges here, so the high gradient edges. Then the next thing is you can compute the corner response. And if you do that, you can actually have a look at uh, different high intensity regions here. You can see this, this looks a lot like corners here. You see this? There's a lot of corners here. And then you can go ahead and do something called a non-maximum suppression. So you look into the no local neighborhood and you suppress all values um, that are smaller than the highest value. This is called a non-max suppression and this will give you distinct points. And here we show the distinct points in red. Now we have a lot of uh, corner candidates, and using the corner candidates, we then select the corners simply by associating um, maxima, local maxima that also have high values. So you get rid of the local maxima that have only low values. Then we selected the corners, and now, sorry, and now you can go back and forth and see if there's actually corners in the image, and you realize that uh, truly detects corners. Okay, so this would be one way of finding interesting points in images. Then, of course, you have to find a, a feature descriptor. And the feature descriptor should describe the local neighborhood in a way such that it is uh, invariant. Invariant to rotation, invariant to intensity, invariant to color, and um, you can also uh, try to do that. So let's say if you have a grayscale image, um, what you like to do is using gradients. So a gradient will be invariant to the global illumination. You can also use colors actually for detecting things. So if you know the object is blue, you can also use color space, uh, color space mappings to figure out uh, also closeness in color space. You can also try to extract uh, frequency features or textures. So you, you can do all of these things to describe them in a feature vector. And I think one of the most popular choices here uh, is SIFT and SURF. So SIFT is uh, the scale invariant feature transform and SURF is a speed up uh, robust feature transform. But also uh, the histogram, um, histogram of oriented gradients and many more you can find to do a local feature description. So if you Google for that, you can actually find plenty of implementations. You don't have to implement all of this by yourself. They typically are toolboxes to do this efficiently. So the first thing is then you do, um, so 
And in particular, we will now look into SIFT. So SIFT is one of the most popular key point uh, detection and uh, feature description systems, so the scale invariant feature transform. And in SIFT, you actually, uh, so the SIFT solution actually tackles this scale problem. And what SIFT does, it, it also constructs a scale space. So there is some similarity uh, to the ideas uh, of Frangi. So he's also constructing by smoothing, different degrees of smoothing, uh, smoothing he is also uh, computing a kind of scale space. And once you um, detect maxima in the scale space, so you're not just computing maxima with respect to x and y, but also in the scale space. And now the interesting point is you essentially blow up your 2D image with an additional direction, which is the scale. And now if you find a maximum in the scale space, this point will be associated with x and y coordinates, but also with a scale. So every key point you detect in the scale space will also be associated with a certain size. And now that's really cool, because if you have two images, let's say, of a person, and he moves towards a camera, and you find an interesting point, let's say a blob that could be a face, here and here they will have a different size. But if you use the scale space maxima, you can still match the two, because by the key point detection, it will tell you something about the standard deviation of this object. It will tell you something about the, the size of this blob here, and the size of this blob here. And then I do a feature extraction, and the feature, uh, feature extraction is using the inherent size of the detected key point. So if I do a match here and here, maybe this way, um, then you will be able to detect the size of this hand and the size of this hand, compute the local feature, and then you limit your feature extraction essentially to the bounding box of this hand and to the bounding box of this hand, and then you get a feature descriptor that will be matchable to those two. Yeah. So the feature descriptors will be the same, although they have been in different sizes in the image. And this is one of the reasons why SIFT became extremely popular. And uh, it has been used in plenty of uh, applications. Uh, one downside of SIFT is uh, there's actually a patent. So if you use SIFT, you, will be, um, you might run into trouble um, with, um, with a patent attorney, because uh, there's a patent on SIFT. But it's a very nice method for detecting points. Uh, to be honest, I have no idea when the patent will expire. So, yeah. But I find it, you can actually look it up. Um, you can try to find the patent and figure out when it was actually filed. But uh, if, you, if you think about that, so this is from 2004, and uh, if you, I think you can expand patents up to 20 years, so it should be, it was probably filed before it was published, so maybe it's from 2003, the patent. Maybe it, in, if it's a US patent, it could be even filed within the year of application, then it would run until 2024. Yeah, too bad. This is one reason there's a very similar approach that is called SURF. That's the speed up robust features, feature extraction, or feature descriptor. And SURF doesn't have, is not uh, protected by a patent. So a lot of people in research uh, use SIFT and then write nice papers and once it goes to industry, they use SURF. <laughs> okay, good. And uh, then, of course, uh, this is interesting because your key point is associated with a scale. The next step is then you do um, orientation estimation. So you look at the, at the gradients in that local neighborhood and you try to estimate the dominant gradient direction. And then you have suddenly key points that have a location, a scale, and an orientation. So this is pretty cool. You run this key point detector and then you have, in the end, you just get a, a list of points that have um, location, scale, and orientation. So this is fairly useful. And then you extract features, the feature descriptor, and then you can go ahead and do your matching. 
So this is really, really a very nice idea. And yeah, probably this is the reason why they decided to actually file a patent for it, because it's a very nice idea. Good, let's look a bit at the scale space extrema detection. So the problem with the Harris corner detector was, of course, uh, let's say you have this point and you have this point. You the, the corner is actually in the center. This is the point where the corner is. But it, if it has this size, you won't get a response here because your Harris corner detector only uh, operates on single individual pixels. So every object in your image typically has a scale where it makes sense. Yeah? And in the scale where it makes sense, you can essentially describe it, or the assumption is that you are able to describe it as a kind of blob. blob. So what you do is you search over all the scales. And we've seen with, uh, with Frangi's approach, one thing you can do is you can just create many smoothed versions and then construct the scale space. So you filter with different versions of the, uh, with different standard deviations of Gaussians, and then you get a kind of low pass uh, version of the image. So uh, this is actually quite interesting. But um, if you do that, then you're constructing this kind of scale space. OK. So this is already quite useful. But later, um, we, want to, we want to construct the Hessian, right? So we want to do a blob detection. We want to construct the Hessian. So we also have to compute derivatives. So we have to compute derivatives in all of those scales. So you at first convolve, then you compute the derivative, and then you construct your, your Hessian. And that actually takes a lot of time. So this is uh, the Laplacian of Gaussian. So what you can do is you can, of course, design a adopted filter. And instead of uh, doing the scale space operation and then deriving, and then co computing the second order derivative, uh, instead you can directly compute the second order derivative and uh, directly convolve with the, uh, with the Laplacian of Gaussian. This will immediately uh, give you the result of the uh, Laplacian at every point in the image. Still, you have to do a lot of convolution. So for every, for every entry here, you have to construct the kernel and then uh, at least uh, three times you have to convolve for every scale. So this is quite a lot. In order to speed this up a bit, uh, in SIFT they had this very nice idea um, to, so this is, uh, you may know this as uh, the Mexican hat, right? This is the second order derivative. The, um, but in SIFT they had this very nice idea. Oh, uh, okay, so this is still a visualization. So this is a, a Laplacian of Gaussian result. Uh, so this is the input image and this is the result image, if you actually do that. In SIFT, uh, and this is different scales. So if you increase the scale, you see how the filter response actually changes. In SIFT, uh, we are using, or they are using a, a different approach. They are using a difference of Gaussians. And with the difference of Gaussians, uh, you can construct your scale space. So you do smoothing at many scales. And then you do an approximation of the uh, Laplacian operator. And you do that by the difference of two Gaussian curves. So let's say you have one Gaussian uh, curve at a higher scale and at a lower scale. They will look like this. Yeah? So this is the, uh, this is the um, high scale where we apply a, a lot of smoothing. And this is our small scale where we have a very nar narrow version. And now we can essentially construct um, a Mexican hat by subtracting the two. So for example, I can um, subtract, I uh, have to do it the other way around. So I subtract, uh, this, I subtract this from this, and then you get your, so you go down here, then you go up, then you go down, and you go up. So I just take two Gaussians, I subtract the two, and I get an approximation of the Mexican hat. And now this is really cool because now I don't have, so what I do is I construct the scale, scale space. So I do, for every scale, scale, I do one convolution. And then 
I just take two neighboring scales and subtract the two from each other, and I get an approximation. Um, and I get an approximation here of the Laplacian. So we can compute that very quickly. So here's a comparison. Oh yes, and uh, so this is the th this is one uh, scale, and this is another scale, and this is the difference of the two. And now, if you look at the two here, you can find that you actually get a very similar result. Yeah. So we can use this trick to work much faster. And another trick that you do in SIFT is not just uh, the difference of Gaussian trick, but you also use, because you are increasing in scale, so you're convolving. And one thing that you can do is, uh, because if you, if you want to end up with a very high degree of smoothing, you will have to use a very large kernel, right? But instead, what you can do is, you can actually convolve multiple times. So I take the same kernel, so let's say I take this, this, this kind of convolution kernel, I can implement very efficiently, right? This is a very small neighborhood, so it can convolve very quickly. But as soon as I start with large contexts, uh, the implementation in spatial domain will get very slow. But since we want to construct the entire scale space anyway, I take the input image and I construct the first scale so let's say this is the first input image, and then I convolve with the same kernel over and over again and keep the result, because I can cascade, um, I can cascade the entire process. Yeah? So if I convolve one time and then I convolve next time, what I will get is essentially an effective convolution with a, li a larger kernel, and I save the intermediate result. So. Constructing this entire pyramid, I can do with subsequent convolutions of always the same image and then storing every version. So I can construct this entire scale space very efficiently. However, I need to use a lot of, uh, I need to use a lot of memory. But at some point, you will realize that you have eliminated all the high frequencies. And if you eliminate all the high frequencies, you actually don't have to store as many coefficients anymore. As soon as you're starting with a, a eliminating uh, frequencies with a factor of two, then you don't need uh, such a dense grid to store the intermediate result anymore. Yeah? So if I have only a low pass image, then I can use a smaller grid. So after some uh, convolutions with a small kernel, if I hit the uh, the limit frequency, I can also store it in fewer coefficients. And in this way, I can construct this kind of pyramid. So as soon as I uh, essentially downsample this image by a factor of two, I can also store it in a grid that has only half of the pixels in every size. Because my, my convolution will be essentially, uh, at, uh, we can essentially also downsample. Yeah? And this is not very nice. So I construct the scale space, and at some point uh, the frequencies get lower and lower, and I need less and less coefficients. So I can do that also very memory effectively. And here I end up with this kind of pyramid. And then I just take neighboring layers, subtract the two, and I'm able to construct such a scale space. And in this scale space, I can then uh, look for maxima. So I end up with this like 3D representation in different scales of the same image, and then I can look for key points at a characteristic scale. OK, good. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to finish, and we will continue on Thursday and shortly look again at this how you can actually cascade a Gaussian in order to construct this pyramid. So we will shortly repeat this again on Thursday. Okay, do you have any questions so far? Good, if that's not the case, then uh, see you on Thursday. <laughs>